Good day, my name is H.B. Charles Jr. I pastor the Shiloh Metropolitan Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida. The author of It Happens After Prayer, and I write a blog that can be found at hbcharlesjr.com. It is my great joy to have with me today Dr. R.A. Williams Jr., who pastors the McCoy Memorial Baptist Church in Los Angeles, California, and who is the president of WHW Ministries that hosts a national preaching conference every year, the first week in October in Los Angeles, California, that has been taking place at this point some 25 years and has been training and investing in young expositors for these years and blessing the country through their work. It's a joy to have you here, Dr. Williams. Great being here. Yeah, tell us a little bit about your background. Where are you from? Tell you what, born in Houston, Texas, uh -huh. um, in the third ward part of the city. Uh -huh. uh, grandfather was a preacher, daddy was a preacher, uncles were preachers. <laughs> 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 Mother played the piano, uh -huh. sister played the piano. Wow. So, you know, I come from a real church family, grew up in church all my life. Uh -huh. uh, Mom died when I was 11. And uh, my daddy uh, raised both of us, my sister and I, and uh, that was pretty traumatic. Sure. but. It was kind of like the Isaiah situation. In, it was in that year that I, I found the Lord, though. Mm -hmm. And uh, my grandmother used to sit and read to us uh, the Bible. And she uh, talked about uh, heaven and seeing your mom again. And so that was one of the great incentives to uh, know Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. to uh, be able to see your mother again. And so um, grew up, grew up. I mean, I had a chance to really uh, know God. It was, and to know poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, I always tell people, you know, one of the things my daddy used to say all the time was that whenever I want something, and he couldn't supply it, he'd always say, well, son, we're gonna have to pray. <laughs> and I remember one day I asked him, I said, Dad, why is it that when everybody else wants something, they go to the store, and when we want something, we got to pray. You know, I was just, because it was always, well, we gotta ask the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, kind of grew up, you know, with that, with that mentality. And uh, I remember, you know, having a real sense of, uh, of uh, what I call it, uh, knowing your situation. You know, I remember high school, you know, my daddy said, uh, I know you want a ring high school ring, and I said, oh, no, I don't want a ring. And I wanted one so bad, I didn't know what to do, but I knew my sister was coming, and I knew we didn't have the money, so I said, oh, no, I get one when I go to college. And then that was another problem, because nobody in the family had ever gone to college. Mm -hmm. So I was determined mm -hmm. by hook or crook, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was going to go. And so, man, I big borrowed, scraped, and I remember once I, uh, I desperately needed m money to uh, go, and I wrote all my relatives, and I told them, you have a chance now to invest <laughs> in my future, because I'm going to be something one day. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I told them, you will have a chance to be on the ground floor. To make a long story short, I, uh, they sent me some money, so I was able to do what I had to do. So, wow. Yeah. So at what point would you, when did you, would you mark the time that you met the Lord personally? Oh, I was 11, 12. 11, 11 12 yeah. year old. Yeah. When in that process do you sense as a, a call to preach? When does, when does that happen? 
But you know what? That was one of the things I sensed at a very early age. Um, I used to ask my daddy all the time, how, how do you know? How do you know? How do you know? Mm -hmm. How do you know? And that was the, what, the big question he oftentimes told me about his calling. Uh, and uh, I had real trouble trying to find the will of God for my life. Felt it. I felt a strong pull and urge. And uh, I fasted. I think it was about seven days. I didn't eat nothing. I didn't only had water. Man, I was looking like death warmed over. I mean, I was, wasn't that big at, in, in the first place. Mm -hmm. But I fasted, and it was so strange. After I came off my fast, my head was clear. It was just clear. I knew that that was my destiny. I knew that's what I was supposed to do, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what it did. Mm -hmm. Do you remember your first sermon? Yeah. Yeah, remember just as plain, just as clear. What was it? Uh, the prodigal son. Uh, nice little story. Uh huh. So. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah. I I think it was. I think it was about. Well, maybe ten or t maybe. I think it was about 15 people at my first sermon. Okay. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. 15 people. And how old are you when you preach your first sermon? 19. 19. So you're already in college. Yeah. Already in college. Oh, yeah. Um, but during those years between 11 and 19, you are following Christ. You are in your dad's church. Yeah. My um, grandfather's there both. What kind of preacher? I've never asked you this. What kind of preacher was your dad? Well, you know what? Let me say something. My daddy never went to school, uh -huh. but was a perpetual student. Okay. In fact, one of the things I think I get my sense of of uh, wanting to know and uh, in investigative uh, procedures is mm -hmm. I think I must have gotten it from my daddy because. Every time, I, I think he took pride in the fact that I'd gone to college and he hadn't, so he always would ask me something that I didn't know always. Uh, boy, I was just reading. And uh, uh, do you know what the Greek word for so? I mean, that was his. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. No, Daddy, come on. Daddy. <laughs> you know yeah. the story behind it? No, Daddy, come on. Daddy. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, so I remember that about him. And that, mm -hmm. That's what I remember most mm -hmm. is that a constant reader, constant, always reading. Um, your early style of preaching, was it heavily influenced by your dad? I think by my dad, but the earlier part, um, I love, I used to love to hear C.L. Franklin. Mm -hmm. I think what changed was the first time I heard a Lewis Patterson. Hmm. The first time I heard a Lewis Patterson, I was pricked in my heart. I was, I had never, <laughs> I, it was as if I said, oh my God, mm -hmm. this is real preaching not that it wasn't preaching before but it was just it just spoke to me sure and i said to myself i had never met him but i said to myself i said boy i would sure like to preach like that i would i was just fascinated mm. i never heard anything mm. and uh, of course years later i met him and uh uh, it's uh, it's uh, a, a strange little story mm -hmm. how, how we met. Uh, I used to pastor in Wharton, mm -hmm. and uh, I, re <laughs> I really had a real fast-growing church down in Wharton. Man, 
I was preaching on the street, on the roof. And mm -hmm. I mean, they had a little place down there called the joints, the front. And man, I'd preach on Saturday, go into the joints, pass our tracks. I mean, I was just. <laughs> As a result, I was influenced a whole lot by uh, Jack Hiles. You ever heard of Jack Hiles? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the Sunday School. First Baptist. First Baptist. Indiana, Hammond, Indiana. Uh -huh. And uh, never shall forget, I went to a conference in Michigan, and he was there. And uh, <laughs> he said, I had met him. He said, where's that boy from Wharton, Texas? I want to challenge you. Go back and build a big sunny school. And this is Hiles? Jack or, Hiles. Jack Hiles, okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, he was a real mess. Okay. He, oh, boy, I can tell you some stories. <laughs> I mean, a real motivator. Uh -huh. I knew how to get you angry enough to do something. I never shall forget. <laughs> he was speaking and he said, oh, I see all you black guys here. Uh, you know, the best b baseball player is back black. The best f football player, yo, what's his name? He's good. You know, he's getting everybody involved. He said, why is it that uh, among the 10 largest Sunday schools, ain't none of them black? Wow. What's wrong with you guys? You, you, you can't build, but I mean, it was like, what? Uh-huh. Uh so, I mean, that was his motivation. And so sure enough, I went back to uh, Wharton and, uh, you know, Wharton's a small town, small church, uh, had about 16 or 17 in Sunday school. We went from 600, I mean, rather from 16 to 17 to 400 to 600 in, in the Sunday school. The church wouldn't even seat that many people. We had tents and stuff, mm. had buses. I mean, we just really just blew up like, wow. really was something. And in fact, the Houston Chronicle did a story on my church in Wharton. The minister's conference in Houston asked me to come and preach for them. A. Lewis Patterson heard me preach. I'd never met him. He heard me preach. And he asked me, would I come and preach at his church? I have not missed a Sunday. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Preaching at his church since then. Really. Wow. Every year? Every year, yeah. Well, wow. Yeah. If I could fill in some of the biography, where did, where did you go to school? Texas Southern University. Texas, where were you going there? To, what did you study there? Psychology. Psychology. Yeah. Um, somewhere during that time, you start preaching, uh, 19. Yeah. Are, are you getting a lot of opportunities to preach? You know, strangely enough, I, uh, during that time, I preached for several people. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to remember, boy, it's been so long. Sure, <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> but I guess not more than normal, but I, I preach quite a bit, mm -hmm. quite a bit. So what happens after you finish college? Well, you know what? I'd always wanted to go to, to seminary. What happened was <clears throat> I got a chance to go to a conference through my college professor to Andover Newton in Boston, stayed there for uh, the conference, so to speak, on campus there. I, I was really, you know, coming from a very conservative background, <laughs> you meet people who don't know who have questions about the deity of Christ and stuff like that. Sure. I'm like, what <laughs> kind of place? Yeah. You were coming from a very conservative background. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was just in the wrong place. I, you know, <laughs> I, you know, raised down south, I mean, yeah. very conservative. You sure. know, you didn't drink or nothing. That was like, Mm -hmm. You guys were going to get beers. I said, oh, my God. I called my dad on the phone. Uh -huh. Daddy. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, I just, I, 
Uh, it was just a horrible experience really uh -huh. for me. You know, I had to, I really had to grow up. I had to know there's a bigger world in mind, but you know, uh, it was just such a turn off. Did you press your way all the way through there? The whole seminary experience there? No, no. No. Uh -huh. no. So you couldn't stay there? No. Mm -mm. No, I came back. Well, I'm going to tell, I, I, I'm going to tell a guy who asked me, do not go to a school where they don't believe the Bible. That's this is a waste say, of time. That, see, now that's what I'm saying. I hate to say that, but you know, it's, it's, I have so many experiences like that. People, I was at uh, Fuller talking to a friend of mine who teaches there. Mm -hmm. And this young man came in and he was, uh, talking about the Egyptian gods and that that's Ra and that's who his, his gods were. And I said, <laughs> and the guy said, no, oh, don't pay any attention to him. He's just a student. He came in as a preacher. He said, come on, <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. he'll be all right. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, I just couldn't believe well, How long after this process do you get to work? You, Oh. You, try, you try seminary. Wait, wait, here is what, here was my plan. Uh -huh. My plan was to go to Howard University uh -huh. in D.C. to seminary there. I just figured I'd go there. I mean, I just figured I had to go. I needed to go. I wanted to go. And so, didn't have any money, but man, that money has never like stopped me from doing, when I wanted to do something, I was just determined I was gonna do it. If I had to write some letters, I was gonna. Sure. <laughs> so, it's the summer, and my plans are to leave after the summer, go to D.C., that's where I'm going. I'm on my way, I'm out of here. My uncle pastors a church in Warden, Texas. They asked me to come and preach until he got better. I didn't know he had terminal cancer. I had no idea. He died. They called me to pastor a church. Mm. Pastor the church. I didn't want a church. I just, I just didn't want one. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just didn't want one. Mm -hmm. And I used to tell my dad all the time, Oh no, you guys know this is not for me. I will preach, but church, oh no, that's not for me. Don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. Make a long story short, they called me. I was, strangely enough, I was afraid of God to turn it down. I just figured, oh, I know you want me to do this, but I, this was not my plan. Mm -hmm. So I ended up passing the church and uh, uh, I was working at the time, so I got a job uh, at the State Department of Public Welfare as an investigative case worker, child abuse cases, and later on uh, uh, with the adoption agency. So uh, I enjoyed that pretty much because I was free, had a car, went, went around, did what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. it was a nice freedom job, mm -hmm. you know. A little pressure sometimes, it was almost like police work sometimes, but it was, I enjoyed it. Um, I stopped by one day in my free time, I stopped by and talked to uh, one of the old pastors in Houston by the name of H.A. King. And he said to me, he said, boy, you need to, I never, he said, you need to be full-time at that church. I said, why, full-time, I, I know, I don't need to do that. He said, yes, sir. He said, you're a gifted preacher. He said, you're a gifted preacher, and the Lord wants to use you, and you need to give this job up and go. I said, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes. I'm just saying, yes, sir. In my mind, I'm saying, you are crazy. Sure. On the outside, I'm saying, yes, sir, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I go home, I mean, this has really rocked my world. It's rocked my world. I mean, I am like, oh, what 
is he talking crazy like that? I'm not going to do that. Why would he tell me that? I'm just going over my mind. So I said to myself, I'm going to tell my wife. That's my first wife who won't go home and be with the Lord. And I said, I'm going to tell her. And I said, and what she's going to say is, that's the craziest thing in the world. And I'm going to say, you're right. And that's going to be the end of that. <laughs> oh, my God. I came home and I told her. And she said, well, Reverend, if that's what the Lord wants you to do, that's what we need to do. I said, no, 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 no. Uh, That was this. I remember that as if it were yesterday. Wow. Ended up moving down there, trying to go full time at a church. And I never shall forget my f- first week didn't have a secretary, so I'm there's the graveyard in the church parking lot, the graveyard, and so I'm saying to myself, I never will forget the first day. I'm looking around, there's nothing, there's nobody, there's cattle over there, and I'm saying to myself. What do these preachers do? <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> I didn't have a model. I'm saying, what do these preachers do all day? What do they do? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm praying. I'm saying, Lord, you got to help me with this. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't have a clue. Mm-hmm. And I'm praying. I never will forget. I'm praying. I'm praying. I'm praying. <clears throat> and I'm saying to the Lord, since I'm here, I want to do the best I can while I'm here. I don't know. I, I just want to give it all. I don't want to use this as a stop. I, I want to. I want to do what I can. I want to do what I can. But I don't know what I'm doing. So you're gonna have to help me. You, you're gonna have to help. I remember praying vehemently, earnestly. Help me. I need to win souls. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't have a plan. I don't know nothing. Mm-hmm. Twenty some years old. I mean, I never, I never shall forget. After praying, about a day or two later, somebody brought me a paper. It was from Houston, and it said, "Learn how to win souls." Billy Graham Association, E. V. Hill at uh, a church, uh, I forget the name of the church, where, where they were having it. I was so excited, I drove down to Houston to the meeting, and sure enough, they were teaching folk how to use the four spiritual laws. Mm. It was the best thing since bubblegum. I mean, I was so excited I mean, just learn. I drove back to Wharton, picked up some people, drove back to Houston. That's 59 miles each way, and got them involved in soul winning, what have you. Met Hinkle, heard that was the first time I heard Patterson preach. I said, wow. Um, went back. To Wharton, that church grew like wildfire. Mm. It was phenomenal. Two questions about the Wharton years. Mm. How are you? To, is it is obvious you have some recognized preaching gift at this point? How is your preaching? developing. You mentioned two influences on you, which uh, from what I understand back in the day, Dr. Patterson didn't even try to hoop back then. No, he didn't. So you got a Dr. Patterson on one end, you mentioned in passing a C.L. Franklin. How are these influences shaping you as a preacher and then what other preachers are influencing the preacher you're becoming during these days? (sighs) Well, you know what, strangely enough, during that era in my life, man, I look back now, 
I was a voracious reader. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> honestly, I was reading stuff like Charnock and like systematic theology. I, I mean, that was what I read. Mm -hmm. I, that was what I ate. I like devoured it. That was, man, I was reading stuff. I didn't know, I don't know exactly, you know, because I would go to, uh, to uh, Keswick. Mm -hmm. And uh, man, I picked up some stuff there. You know, and how you you look at bibliographies and what to read and how to build your library and different things like that. Yeah. And so I was really, really, I think really I was probably beyond my years because that's I mean I just stuff that nobody else was interested in. I mean I was. I was really, really interested in it. Okay. And so, as a result of that, uh, that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And it was just shaping your preaching through that's your reading. That's what, yeah. So, yeah. Curiosity is right. diligence curiosity, and reading yeah. is research. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the other question I wanted to ask, were any other persons besides the two you mentioned were influencing your preaching during these days? At that time, no. Those, those I think were the two. those were the two, mm -hmm. basically. Um, uh, possibly to Stephen Olford, because mm -hmm. uh, I was going to Keswick, and sure. he was one of the guys there. And uh, I read a lot of those though too. I, I'm, I remember, um, yeah, because I was always fascinated with how they did what they did, and so. Yeah. The other question I wanted to ask about the warden here is, is over the years that uh, I've known you, you talk about those warden years as years of great blessings on your ministry, but some of the toughest times you've had yeah. were also during those years of your first pastor. Yeah. Um, tell us about the challenge part, <laughs> you, you, you know, don't leave it at the, it was growth and, <laughs> and then souls being saved. Yeah. There was some other stuff going on oh, yeah. too during those years. Yeah, well, you know, one of the things that, that happened as a result of the growth, the rapid growth, you know, you've come to find out people are afraid of losing their place. Sure. In church, especially in a place in a town where there's nothing else to do, it's just church is your is your life, and so your positions. Are, this is really something. Mm -hmm. And so when this church is growing, this church is, and I had a habit then of uh, I only highlighted <laughs> the soul winners. Okay, I was standing them up. Well, if you're not winning the souls, you, you're not highlighted. Mm -hmm. So you, you feel this sense of we're losing out. We can't sit where we used to. We can't do what we used to do. Right. And, uh, you know, you start hearing, I'm tired of all these other people coming in here. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't understand, you know, in some ways I was so naive. I was so naive. I, I, I think my daddy that must have kept me on the farm or something, because I just believed. Sure. <laughs> I just honestly believed that folk in church love Jesus. Mm -hmm. I, just, I, I really believe that. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I had one deacon to say to me, Reverend, I don't care what the Bible says. Man, I thought the lightning was coming down from heaven. <laughs> striking me. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, I never, I never, I must have been on the farm, so I had never mm -hmm. seen that. I never, I never heard that before. Sure. And, uh, 
you know, you, you, you're trying to get things straight and you have business meetings and you say, well, every person who's in leadership has to do this, has to do this. And yet you got this group of guys that we ain't doing nothing. Right. So when it comes down time, when they have not, and you move them, oh God, oh hell broke loose. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like I'd never seen anything before in my life. Mm. And, and of course, it's the kind of place where you basically are an outsider. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you're an outsider. Mm -hmm. And it's a little country town and they know Jim and Jack and the sheriff knows Jim and Jack and John and. <laughs> wow, uh-huh. <laughs> <It's> so <laughs> you are basically an outsider. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I remember, <laughs> I guess though the Lord was building me to a point, he had to been building me to that point where, you know, I could take stuff, you know, cause before, you know, he would say stuff and I'd be wiping my eyes, be wiping the tears out of my eyes. Mm -hmm. But after a while, man, I changed from a lamb to a lion. Yeah. Yeah, and so it, it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think God was, was, was shaping me in the process of being stronger and able to deal with, it was really the, the building stage. There's no way I could have come to LA without going through, I mean, there's no way. Yeah, well, two things, one statement and then a, a question. The, the statement is, you know, that when you're going through stuff like that, you don't know why. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, Lord, and yeah. then you can look back over them, yeah. like you said, yeah. down the road, yeah. what, what the Lord put you into, you never would be ready for yeah. if he hadn't taken you through right. those uh, previous things. And that's not, I mean, I'm not, I'm not talking about pew stuff, I'm talking about pastors. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I think, conflict in the church God uses yeah. to, to affirm us as leaders Absolutely. and to equip us as um, leaders. Um, what you're describing, though, happens a lot. Yeah. I, I'm watching a younger generation of guys who are coming out of seminary and hear enough of these stories, see enough of those stories to say, I'd rather plant a church oh, than to yeah. go through the, because there is that very real challenge of you going to a place, oh, yeah. it don't matter what the size of the city is. Yeah. This is us's church. Yeah. And I've been deacon, it's been my Sunday school. Yeah. I mean, that's where, it, my first pastorate in Los Angeles, that's where all hell broke loose for me. Yeah. I mean, us. Sunday school yeah. person. Yeah. Um, what would you say, I mean, advice for a young guy? Because the fact is many young pastors are gonna start in an established church and it is not going to be easy. And if you walk in there and think you are a pastor, the pastor when you walk in, they are going to run you out of there. Yeah. Yes? Absolutely. Um, what advice would you give if you, you know what, as I look back over it, there are several things I would say. Number one, enjoy the lesson. Hmm. Uh, the thing I had problems with, I, you know, you're told when you're a kid, you know, you do the right thing, everything's gonna be all right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's not necessarily true <laughs> in a sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, my problem with God, I had a real problem with God because I'm saying, all I do is win souls. I mean, I haven't done nothing. Sure. I mean, the only thing I had done mm -hmm. was brought people into the kingdom. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, I said, and you, I was upset. <laughs> with God, because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I couldn't understand. You know, you, you do the right thing, the right thing's supposed to happen. Didn't have a clue as to even what James says, count it all joy when you fall in diverse trials. Knowing this is a trial of your faith, work at patience, let patience have its perfect or its maturing work that you can be complete. Mm 
mm -hmm. lacking nothing. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that I, I tell people this all the time, God never wastes time. Hmm. I don't care what you're going through. He's not wasting time. He always has something up. He's got something up. My, my. And when you come to know that, Enjoy where you are. Learn all you can where you are. Yeah. I mean, come to understand this. After 67 years of living, and I look back, you know what? I look back on older people. I'm older myself. I understand. They don't like you coming in. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Right, right, right. <laughs> no. The simple as that. Simple as that. Uh-huh. <laughs> Don't know you. <laughs> right, right. Who are you? Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. They trusted Rum Jogobo. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Mean, they, they knew him. Uh-huh. He did something for them. Sure. I mean, they don't know you. They don't, they don't trust you. Sure. You got to know that. Sure. That you are not the pastor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yes, sir. And I think once you come to grips to understand that, that, you know, you're gonna have to earn the trust. You're gonna have to earn, and God is firming you. He's He's getting you ready for leadership. He's He's processing you. He's taking you through. He, man, I I see things so differently now sure. than, uh, than when I did. And I tell people, I was just telling the guy the other day, man, enjoy where you're. I mean, and learn this lesson well. Sure. Learn it well. And I remember going through it. I was so bitter. I just I was just bitter, bitter, bitter. And uh just going through it. And I remember uh the the time I was going through it, I was I was fasting. I mean, I had fasted, so I was like skin, and I mean, I just said, I'm just going to die. I just said, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess God must have had a big laugh up in heaven. I was, I'm saying, this is it. You, you, you don't come through. You don't come through at all. You just don't come through. I'm just, I'm just going to preach and die. This, this is it. I wrote my obituary, believe it or not. <laughs> Are you for real? <laughs> yes, sir. I wrote the obituary. Uh huh. My wife got a hold of my obituary. She said, What is this? <laughs> you mind, I'm 20 something years old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. Uh -huh. She said, What is this? Uh huh. <laughs> she, you know, she knows. My, I, man, my mind is like stubborn. I'm like, mm hmm, mm hmm. So. She called another stubborn preacher. I don't know if you know Pastor Charles Jackson out of Houston. Mm -hmm. And I never will forget it. Jack drove down to Houston. I mean, drove down to Wharton. And he said, all right, what you gonna do, kill yourself? I said, yeah, I may as well, the Lord. I don't know what he's doing. He ain't saying nothing. I'm through. This is it. I'm just, this is it. I tried to do the best I could. This is it. Mm -hmm. And he said to me these words, he said, you know, you used to always tell me you admired my testimony on the, on the back of the dump truck and how the Lord saved you and yada, yada, yada. I said, yeah. And I never had a testimony like that. I, I, I grew up in church. I ain't done. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what beer tastes like. I don't know. What, I mean, I grew up in church. Mm -hmm. So... I, I never could say I was drunk, I was sober, I was so-and-so, I was so sure. I always said, man, I wish the Lord would, I used to always say that, <laughs> Lord would give me a testimony like that so I could say something. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, uh-huh. So he said to me these words, and I wish I forget, he said, the Lord is trying to give you a testimony. Mm. Or you can bless others by what you're going through. Mm. He said, and I want you to start eating, and I'm going to pray for you. Mm. I never will forget. We went to the church. I went to the pulpit. I got out on my knees. He prayed for me. Mm. I think about that. What, 
Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. I was at the lowest point in my life. Mm -hmm. When he prayed for me, and I got up off my knees, it was as if weights had fallen off of me. It was as if I was free as a bird. Mm. And I told the Lord, I said, okay, whatever you do, it's okay with me. Mm. We cool, we all right. <laughs> and man, I went, it just went through it, just went through it. Mm -hmm. Just went through it. My, my. By the time you leave, though, it, it had calmed down? Oh, my goodness. So you we, weathered it off. We went to court. We, 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 we won and everything, and I was determined. That's, that, that's another part of the story. I'm, you know, we, we won. We're back in. We, everything is all right. I'm winning souls. We're taking in people. Mm -hmm. I'm determined. We're, we're going to build a big work down here. So, strangely enough, I remember the Sunday, we took in about eight men, and we are rolling again. We are rolling. And these guys came down from Houston, <laughs> and uh, they, um, <laughs> they asked me, I could tell they wasn't from the area, all dressed up. And they asked me about a church in Houston, what where they had the citywide revival. The, I think it was named Shiloh. Mm. <laughs> and I said, well, what happened to this? Oh, we put him out. We saw and so so and so. So, so young man, and we need you to come and for a young man like you, the sky's the limit. So when can you come preach? I said, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's right. I can't. Mm -hmm. See, I never should get. They said, young man, do you know where Shallow is? Have, have you seen Shallow? Uh -huh. yeah, I know where it is. When y'all had the citywide revival, I know where it is. <laughs> I know exactly where it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I didn't. Man, people call me. Are oh, you crazy? Man, I. Ain't. Mm -mm. I knew the Lord. I said, mm -mm, no, sir. Uh -huh. So, not many days hence, though, I'm watching Gunsmoke. I got another call. <laughs> <laughs> it's somebody in California. I don't know. It's Dillard. I, he said, man, I just recommended you to a church in, in Los Angeles. I said, mm-hmm. <laughs> I am like, I am like church skittish. I'm very skittish. Sure. I'm shy. I'm like, ugh, ugh. Right. So I talked to somebody on the phone. I think it was Thelma. Somebody said, yeah, we have to, our pastor been dead and yada, yada. We want you to come and preach for us, yada, yada. I said, mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. I got your number. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I hung the phone. I said, shoot, I ain't going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, I'm not going to do Had you that. ever been to Los Angeles? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> no I didn't lose nothing there. I didn't uh -huh. want to go there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so E. Lewis Patterson called me on the phone. All right, did, you, did they call you down there? I said, yeah, Doc. I, they told me to send over. I said, but I'm not doing that. Doc has always been like daddy figure. Sure. He said, all right. I said, yes, sir. Send the resume. I said, yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> uh huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> said, yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. I sent a resume, but I'm saying to myself, I ain't going down there, though. Mm -hmm. I'm not going down there. Mm -hmm. I ain't going down there. So they call. I don't answer. They don't call. I don't answer. I look up one Sunday. The ushers hand me a limo, said, you got some visitors here. I said, how do you know? They said, but they're not from out of here. I said, how do you know they're not from around here? They said, the way they're dressed. <laughs> 
Uh-huh. Keep in mind, I look to the door and I said, no, they're not clean. <laughs> they're too clean. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> so they said, you wouldn't call us. You wouldn't come. So we came to see you. Mm. So since we've come to see you, would you come preach? Would you? Man, I was so embarrassed. I said, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the rest is history. I preached. I didn't want a church when I came. I did not want, I didn't want to come. Mm -hmm. I just didn't. I preached. I wasn't impressed with nothing. Okay. <laughs> did you hear what I said? Uh-huh. Nothing. Uh-huh. I just didn't want to. I just, sure enough, Oh, this is a terrible story, HB. This is a terrible <laughs> story. Uh -huh. They called me. Evie Hill and Doc Pat called me and said, all right, we got to get you ready, so-and-so, you know, for the interview. You tell, here's what you tell them, so-and-so, so on. I said, mm. <laughs> I'm reluctantly. Uh -huh. I'm saying, yes, sir, outside, but inside, I'm, I don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I go on a Sunday, like they told me, had a meeting with the church Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, et cetera. Told them what I wanted, told them everything. They said, no problem, Reverend. I wanted them to say no. Yeah. I, in my heart, Heart of hearts, I wanted them to say no. Mm -hmm. So they said, Reverend, are you going to accept it? And this is my hand to God. What I plan to do is go home and write him a nice letter and tell him thank you, but no thank you. Yeah. I said, this is how I know God must have really intended for it because what I said, I'm going to ask you this. I said to them, well, you all don't have a treasurer. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they read to you. I said, you all don't have a treasurer. And just let me appoint Brother Hill as temporary treasurer until uh, I'm trying to fish for, for words. Uh-huh. Until uh, I get back or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was my statement. Uh huh. <laughs> that was it. Uh huh. That was a pause, a hush over the current. I mean, just a, a hush. And then everybody starts saying, Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. I was saying, I did not say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was saying, I was, wow. I was, I was saying, oh, God, no, 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 no. Uh -huh. I was saying to myself, no, uh -huh. no. Uh -huh. <laughs> so uh, I never shall forget. <laughs> I think everybody else, that was an old professor down at Warden. And I'm bemoaning the fact that I got to go to Los Angeles. He said, son, you're a big fish in a small pond. You can't stay here. Hmm. You can't stay here. I said, okay. I mean, I dread, I drug my feet, even trying to move. My wife said to me, I'd gone to preach a revival. She said, Reverend, while you were gone, your church called. I told them to send the money, the moving trucks, the moving vans. They'll be here soon. Because I know you. I know you'd have found some way to say me. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow, wow. So that's basically, that's basically how I got there, really. My, my, my. Yeah. I never shall forget the people were there. They met me at the airport with signs saying, welcome pastor, welcome pastor. And I was saying to my wife, I said, wow, 
I think they like me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you've been there how many years now? 35. 35 years. Yeah. This, I got a bunch more questions, but let me ask here. What is, um, a lot of churches have dealt with this over the years. The community the church was in when you got there is non-existent. Yeah, you're right. Um, this is, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if this is a dynamic in a lot of cities, but it's, this was Los Angeles. Right. Um, what, what, was, what was that transition like? Was that a gradual thing? Um, our church was on the <laughs> Midtown area. Yeah. Um, the area where McCoy is, is um, and there's a lot of historic churches over there yeah. too. Um, but that, the, the whole community has changed over the years. Oh, it's, it's changed. Uh huh. And uh, you hurt. You, you really hurt. But what we've been trying to do is to minister to the, uh, the uh, Hispanics. Mm -hmm. um, and strangely enough, I mean, I want them. I want everybody who's in. I, I don't care. I mean, I, sure. want, I want them all. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's, where I'm, that's where I'm at right now. That's, that's where we're trying to go. That's where we're trying to go. We're just taking a, another family um, Sunday. Uh, and I want them all. I don't. I Praise don't, God. I, I want them all. Amen. <laughs> now, you know, uh, the preachers of L.A. now are known for something different than the preachers of L.A. then. It was some major preachers and major churches in Los Angeles. What, what, did, what was it like when you got there? You didn't want to go. Did, did the city immediately grow on you? Did it take some time? What did you think of the church culture when you got there? None of that. None. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, I don't know. It was totally different. I, I, I noticed this. The culture was different from down south. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had to get used to it. I really was just... I must have been in a bubble or something. I really, when I look back on it, uh, you know, just the culture, what people did. I, I was like totally blown away. I just couldn't, I couldn't understand it. Uh -huh, I, uh -huh, uh -huh. I couldn't understand how people went to church. I couldn't understand. It was just a whole nother. I couldn't understand how much houses cost. I couldn't, it was just right. a total, I had to get used to it. I really did. Mm -hmm. And what people said and mm -hmm. how people acted and, and I think the, the flamboyance of everybody there, I never, you know, you come from Texas, boy, you. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, I never, I wasn't used to it. Wow. At a certain point, you are in a rhythm and become known for your commitment to Bible exposition. At what stage of your preaching ministry? Is this pre-McCoy, or does that, do you get in that rhythm of expository preaching once you get to Los Angeles? Well, you know what? I'm, like I said, I'm very interested. I'm, I'm very, very, curious. I mean, I am like, my wife will tell you, I stayed in my study more. I mean, I, I live there. Mm -hmm. I, it's a wonder <laughs> I lived there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was reading Greek before I went to seminary. I was doing that. I was, uh, but you know what? I, I needed a system. Mm. I needed a system. I needed a system as to how to do it. Did was doing some stuff, but I needed a system. 
It was only when I went to Cobe, Congress on Biblical Exposition, when all they brought in all the great expositors and what have you, and an old fellow by the name of Dr. Earl Ratmacher. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ratmacher is one of the general editors of the Nelson Study Bible. Mm -hmm. he, he doesn't know it, but he is really the grandfather of WHW. Okay. He, honestly. Uh -huh. uh, he was an old white guy. Uh, never shall forget at, at Cope, I remember um, seeing all the other people and I remember it was an afternoon class. It was an afternoon class. You know how it is when you get through eating, you really, really rather be somewhere, you know, you're lethargic. You're... I go in, I see this old guy, and I said to myself, I'm not gonna stay in here long, I know. Never shall forget it. This guy, open with John 15 and walked through the chapters 13, 14, 15. I had never seen anything like it in my life. I said to myself, oh my God, it was as if Christmas morning had come, the Easter bunny, I mean, uh -huh. <laughs> it was, this is what I've been looking for. This is it. Mm -hmm. And man, I was like mesmerized. I mean, gave me the system, whole thing. I mean, I was like, I got it. I know what I'm doing now. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. And wow. um, it was really, I can remember, it was like the heavens broke through. It was like, I see it. And it was from that point, man, I was. When did you start, when did you start preaching through books? Did that happen after you got to LA or were you doing that before you got to LA? Well, before I got to LA, uh, only books I preached through, I remember preaching not through, but portions of, portions of the, the Samuel, David, Saul, Jonathan, Jonathan, David, Saul, David, mm -hmm. uh, you know, going through the story or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but no real going through until I, get to, until I got to L.A., really. And, and how did the church receive that? Because that's not a norm in, no. in black churches. Um. <laughs> I think pretty well if you package it, you know, mm -hmm. if I think if you don't make it seem like you're in school. Sure. And if you it's it's almost like really, really packaging it. It's kind of like what my mom told me. She, she tells the story, she used to tell me the story of when I was a little baby. She used to let my grand, my godmother keep me and she, while she went to work. And so she said, when she get back home, she said, she said, I was growing like just big, just putting on weight. And she said, who did she feed me? Mm -hmm. See, she came up with that one day and my godmother was chewing up black eyed peas and cornbread and meat and, and putting it in my mouth and said, I was junk. Sure. And I think sometimes, you know, with uh, church, you know, when you're starting people out like that, you, you just have to chew it up. Mm -hmm. You have to chew it up. Yeah. I, I think um, expository preaching gets a bad rap. Yeah, it does. Because what some people are doing is not yeah. but just getting up doing a running commentary. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Seem is not expository right. preaching. Absolutely. Because both of those are at play. Yeah. The exposition, yeah. but it needs to be preaching. Yeah. 
you need to yeah. think about <laughs> yeah. homiletics. Yeah. Yes? Absolutely. Uh -huh. Absolutely. So you got a system down. Yeah. What in, um, what would be a typical week of preparation for you? And maybe it's changed now at this stage of the game, but in, in, a, in the extended rhythm of your pastoral ministry, it is Sunday night. Um, Monday, it is Monday. You have six days out. What, what, what are you doing with that time to get to the pulpit that next Sunday? I'm, I'm doing two things. Okay. One, I'm reading, reading, reading. And what I'm reading, with me, I have to have a sense of what is the passage saying in a succinct way. Mm -hmm. I, I need to be able to put it, and until I get that, I'm, I'm still out. I'm still out. I'm still trying to, to, um, to put it where I can talk it. Let me ask you this before you go further. Sunday night, do you know what you're preaching next Sunday? Oh, yeah, I okay. basically. You plan that, you plan up preaching. I basically, especially if I'm going through, through a book, book gotcha. or through a chapter or through something, I know gotcha. already, and as a result, I mean, <laughs> you know, I tell people all the time, you know, one of the things I really like to do hmm. is go to bed on it. Mm -hmm. Read it, read it. Read it before I go to bed. Read it, read it, read it, read it, read it, read it, and get in the bed <laughs> and go over it and go to sleep with it. Uh. You did that to me. That's for me. Yeah. Oh God, that's almost like because sometimes I get up out of the bed and, and say, "Oh, got it, got it, got it, got it." Yeah, got yeah, yeah. It. yeah. Uh -huh. So I, I get up. It just all depends. But I mean, I'm gonna read it, read it, read it. Um, and then I'm going to, you know, once I get the context down, once I get basically, I need to know what he's saying. Mm -hmm. I need to get a clear understanding and I need to know uh, uh, how he's saying it. I, I need to, for me, I have to know in essence, in a capsule, what is he saying? Yeah. Now, once I know that, mm -hmm. and it's it follows the line of its its how it naturally falls, uh, then I'm for me. Once I get that hard part, the rest of the part to me is almost mechanics and putting meat on the bone and what have you. In fact. <laughs> I, sometimes at my church, I do a little thing. I say, now let me give you the sermon in a nutshell, in case you don't get nothing else. Yeah. Here's what he's saying. Yeah. One, two, three. Now this is all he's saying. Uh -huh. I said, so if you go to sleep, this is what, this is it. Now I'm going to give you the long version. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Has it been your tradition over the years? Are you, well, let's, let's start this. Over the years, when are you done with it? Boy, you, you, you would have to ask that. <laughs> HB, I hate to say this. Oh, boy, I get you. I ain't never done. Yeah, I hear you. I, I, You're not one of them guys to say, I'm done Thursday or I'm done Friday and... I'm Thursday, I'm ready to preach Sunday. You you still messing with it until it's time to preach. I'm still messing with it. Yeah. I hate to say that, but okay. I'm still I'm, 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 I'm messing with it. Are you have you been traditionally a manuscript? Are you writing out are you writing notes as you're studying? Are you saving those notes? Or are you just reading it and, and That's a good question. You know what? In my latter years, I've started really having somebody to write it out, to write it out, to write it out, and that's because <laughs> I used to just nothing, just a few scraps, 
And then I'd go back to try to find those scraps. And yeah. I was preaching for a friend of mine, and he said to me, all right, you need to be ashamed of yourself. I said, what? He says, a greater preacher as you are, you, you appear with these little scraps of paper on your, <laughs> written all in them. Uh-huh. So he showed me a little system how to do it on my computer. Mm-hmm. And so I've been able to um, put that together and kind of keep a chronicle, a catalog of, of what I got. Now, you kind of almost, you know, I, I'm, I'm working on the meaning of the text and then just kind of putting meat on the bones. But w- one of the things about your preaching that stands out is that you, you are working on homiletics. Okay. Yes. You're not just. No. 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 <laughs> no. Um, no. My question is about the homiletics. In comparative, if you're dealing with the time in the text and the time on the sermon, comparative, I mean, how, how are you dividing? However long that time is over the course of any given week, is this almost 50-50 amount of time, or is the bulk of the time on the text? Well, once to me, my interpretation is clear, the syntax is clear, the word study is clear, once it's clear, clear. I, I have to have it clear. I, with me, once I get it clear, I am then working on how to make this thing clear interesting. To them. Clear yeah. to them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. yeah, that's what I, I mean. Uh-huh. I want to, and then I may bounce it off somebody. Yeah. I may uh, call a friend of mine or something and say, I mean, because this is serious business to me. I mean, this is serious business to me. And so mm-hmm. I, I mean, you know, I don't want to be boring. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to try to impress people with what I know. I, I really want to get over. Yeah. I, I mean, that's what I really want to do. I really want to do that. And mm-hmm. so... Um, I'm searching for ways, I'm searching for illustrations, I'm searching for uh, things to uh, use mm-hmm. to uh, make it palatable. Well, uh, another question, big question. <laughs> so my introduction to expository preacher is through books. Then when I am, as a teenager, I'm reading about expository preaching. This is, immediately, this is the right thing. My father was kind of though the uh, sure. orator kind sure. of preacher, those classic D.E. Yeah, King right. kind of guys. So well, this, is, this is new to me. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced this is right as I'm seeing it. Then when I start seeing examples of what I'm reading, um, they are predominantly white guys initially. Yeah. But what I am seeing them do is I'm watching how they're handling the text. Right. You almost say, there's no way I could get away with right. that in my context. Yeah. There's, a, there's a different cultural thing. Yeah. Um, so you're one of the first, one of the initial persons I heard that had an influence on me. But you're the first one as well who was marrying just straight up exposition and just does a flat out hooper at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> And that discussion is a big discussion for younger men now. Um, I started out, I was the, before I knew I was going to be an expositor, I knew I was going to be a hooper. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, sure. wasn't, it wasn't even, sure. and my father was trying to discourage it every way he could, and I was a tree <laughs> planted by the rivers mm-hmm. of the water. Um, yeah. Younger men are struggling with that. Yeah. Um, your preaching, you're known for both. Your handling of the text and the fact that you could shut those that down. And you've never been, from my vantage point of view, defensive about that. You yeah. know, you, it was never, I think, a thing for you yeah. it, um, in, in, in one way or another. Yeah. And there are 
people struggling, younger guys struggling with the place of all of this? What, what's, what's just, what, were, what are your thoughts about hooping in preaching? Well, you know what? I think it's the flavoring. It's the accent. Okay. It's that which, to me, makes it alive. It's, it's part of my culture. Uh -huh. And I think oftentimes we deny what is rightfully what God has given to us. You know, how does a, a red bird apologize for its song compared to the robin? <laughs> I, you don't apologize for that. I mean, when I hear opera, I mean, I mean, that's their culture where mm -hmm. I go to. If you've been to the Holy Land at the Wailing Wall, I mean, those guys are praying and they're, they're tuning up. I mean, they're, they're like, they're not apologizing. Yeah. If you, if you hear the Arabs praying over the microphone, mm -hmm. like, ain't nobody apologizing for that. <laughs> <laughs> We're the only group that trusts. Well, let me explain to you. Uh-huh, uh-huh. No. <laughs> uh-huh. It's crazy. Uh-huh. So I'm, I'm saying, you know, it, it's amazing to me sometimes, you know, and, <laughs> you know, I have a Jewish couple who comes to my church every Sunday. I'm wondering, what are you doing here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> what are you doing? You know, I am not apologizing for what I do and they mm -hmm. come. I mean, I think that there's a place, there's a place uh, as long as it's, I mean, as long as I think you've dealt with this text, you've done your work, you've done, man, I, I like to hear a little hooping, I like to. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with uh, heat and light in preaching. Yeah. Yeah. Now, over the years, I'm giving, are you going to get it every Sunday? <sighs> That's a question. Sometimes not. I don't feel like it sometimes. Sometimes. And if you're preaching through books or through a series, Every sermon doesn't no. lend itself. No, that's what I'm saying. To I, that, I mean, I don't. you know, somebody asked me this week, "Did I hoop this Sunday?" And I said, uh, "I'm preaching the seven churches, yeah. and I'm at the church at Thyatira, and uh, yeah. I, you know, I'm fussing at my church about this church tolerating this Jezebel yeah. that are leading. I just couldn't find a way to get from Jezebel to Ain't He All Right. And see, and, see, and that's what I'm saying. Uh -huh. you, 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 honestly, you come to that point where this ain't it. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. and, and, I, and, I, and I think in any given, in any discussion of preaching, I think it should be said that there should be a process of the leading of the Spirit. Yeah, absolutely. Even if you're preaching the, you absolutely. know, you, you preach regularly, but there is in that dynamic the fact that the a same sermon you preach over and over is really almost not the same sermon. Absolutely. Because there is a, there is a work of the Spirit in the moment of absolutely. preaching. Absolutely. Um, and that would include not just you may introduce it or explain it or illustrate a different, and I think when you get to the end, yeah. how you are going to conclude right. that is, right. is, a, is a matter of the leading Absolutely. of the Holy Spirit. You, at a certain point, um, one day, I'm, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm trying not to talk like this because I'm not trying to make you this old guy, <laughs> but uh, I'm, a new, I'm, I'm a young preacher, and I get a card in the mail. And I'm, I'm struggling. I want to do exposition, but what you said earlier is important. I am, I am listening and imitating what I'm hearing, and I don't have a mental process of how to get through this. Um, and I, I mean, I'm just, I'm listening to your preaching, and I am imitating what I hear, but I don't have a process of this is a and so you become these clones. Yeah. You know, I'm a, yeah. a clone of E.K. Bailey and R.A. Williams yeah. and these guys. Um, I get this card in the mail, 
that um, says for a new conference, and it says, uh, come, come learn to dig your own well so you don't have to steal other people's water. And uh, I attended that conference, and it was life-changing to me. I did hear a sermon during one of those sessions and stolen when preached it that Wednesday night at my church. But, <laughs> but this is a conference that you, Dr., the late Dr. Larry Harris, mm -hmm. and Dr. George Waddles oh, yeah. established. If I remember correct, it was like called best at yeah. that, yeah. At that, yeah, at that initial time. Um, it is better than 20 years later, that conference is still going strong. But yeah. tell us about how this, this process leads to the development of this, of this conference. Well, you know, as I said before, we had gone to this conference called COBE, mm -hmm. Congress on Biblical Exposition. Mm -hmm. uh, they brought in, um, it was at Second Baptist Church in Houston. They brought in all these guys. They brought in, in fact, the only well, there was one other black fellow by the name of John Perkins mm -hmm. and A. Lewis Patterson, who was a part of that. Um, and as I said before, when this conference was over, once I saw it, once I, you know, we were standing in the parking lot and we said, man, we, this, this is something the black community really, really needs. And we were looking around and said, man, why aren't more black guys here? Yeah. And <laughs> it was only three of, three of us, I think. And <laughs> we were just saying, wow, you know. And, <laughs> you know, I, I never forget it. We, we thought about it, but, you know, here again, you wonder sometimes what you're interested in may, may not be what other guys are interested in. And I've come to realize that, and that's why I'm not mad with anybody who doesn't want to come or nothing like that, because that's, if you're interested, you are. Mm -hmm. um, but we decided then that we were going to do it. George, uh, you know, it's kind of like Harris and I were always the rebels, the outsiders, the mavericks. George was in the system. <laughs> He's a part of the matrix. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. so, 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 so we said, oh, man, I don't know whether we could pull this off. And George said, man, I think we could. Cause <laughs> he said, I got, I got the mailing list for the pastors. <laughs> and, you know, we, it was from there that we decided to do it. I, I think the only problem that we found out <laughs> was that there not many people were interested. I mean, we thought not so. I think we had 20 some or 30 some the first time. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and I think, man, we lost so much. We didn't, have, we didn't know what we were doing. Mm -hmm. We did not know what we were doing at all, just trying to help. That was the whole purpose, just sure. trying to help. And year after year, it got increasingly, you know, larger, but not by much. It was, you know, and the, the funny thing was that every year we would say, this is it, we're through. Wow. We're through, every year. Uh -huh. And then somebody would ultimately come up and say, inevitably, they would say, I remember once I was in preaching in Northern California, and this guy walked, well, he was crying, he was crying, he was crying like a little baby, and he was saying, man, your conference helped me, all oh, the conference, thank you so much. I just got on the phone with George, and I said, man, this is it, man, look here, yeah, we through, I'm through, we uh -huh. through, I ain't doing this no more. And every year, somebody would say something. We said, well, we got to do it again. We got to do one more. Got to do <laughs> one, one more. more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the strength of the conference is it's been its laser focus. Um, word studies, grammar, context. Culture. And culture. Yeah. Um, that's been from the beginning. From the beginning. And... Um, 
This is one of the unique features. Sometimes our preaching conferences are just preaching. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the uh, WHW really focuses on the workshop aspect. And that's what we wanted to make the difference. That was, you know, man, in our culture, man, we got preachers who can preach. It's, it's no if and buts about that. We got guys who can do it. But I think the problem oftentimes is learning how to do it, learning how to do what to do and how to do it right and learn, learning. You know, basically people, we learn from watching other people from, nobody gave you a technique, nobody gave you a purpose, nobody gave you a, a, as to what to do. And so that was the purpose of the, of the conference was to teach folk how to do. You know, our sure. thing was not only come here a great preacher, but learn how to become one. And you, you can't teach a person how to do Greek no. in a week, but you no. can show them how to use the tools. Absolutely. Needed Absolutely. to work your way through Absolutely. that. And you all do that yeah. well. One of the things, and if you don't want to comment on this, you don't have to, but I'm going to say it. <laughs> um, one year I go to the conference, so you're getting started, and like one of the opening sections, you got Wayne House. And you introduce Wayne House, and he's going to talk about women in ministry. And Man, I'm sitting in the back with guys who are, you know, so excited to be at the conference. And Dr. House gets going, and these guys are livid. <laughs> um, and a lot of things we do, both convention and conferences, we don't talk about what we believe or mm -hmm. what the Bible says mm -hmm. for the sake of holding things mm -hmm. together. Um, one of the years I went to hear you in your annual address, you, you know, you preached on election. You know, um, would you say this was an intentional thing? You, you're, uh, my point is that you all are talking about doctrinal things, yeah. and you're not hiding yeah. what your convictions about the scriptures yeah. are. <laughs> are. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's just you just that's not a big thing to you. No, right. I mean, you know, Amen. we. We're doing what we do. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't apologize for that. Amen. Just, you know, Amen. You know, my wife just told me the other day, somebody interviewed me, and she said, well, that, that, that sounds a little arrogant. I said, no, it's not arrogant. It's just what we do. If this is what we do, I ain't, I'm not apologizing for what we I said, everybody has an opinion. If you got yours, it's okay, but sure. respect mine. Amen. I respect yours, you mm -hmm. respect mine. Mm -hmm. And that's, I don't, I don't have a problem with that. Sure. And to be honest, though, you are, you, you, you are not, a person is not doing real exposition if it's not leading to doctrinal conclusions and convictions. See, now that's what I'm saying. Uh -huh. you, you, I didn't want to say that, but since you said it, see, uh -huh. now that's, that's one of the problems is that people sometimes learn a little bit, learn a little something, uh -huh. and they think, oh, this is it. It's no, mm -hmm. no, mm -hmm. because you will discover, you will discover some things you didn't want to discover. Oh. <laughs> yeah. you see some stuff Man, you didn't want to I see. Man, I say, but that text can mess up a good sermon idea. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so, you know, that's one of the things that you know, you have to be aware of. Sure. But if you're doing expository preaching, it's, 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 it should be shaping the life of yeah. the church, right. spiritually, doctrinally. You know, right. it's not just about you learning some Greek right. or Hebrew word yeah. and finding something to dump folk with. Absolutely. It, it ought to be shaping yeah. the perspective of the church over, Absolutely. over time. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate um, you know, and I, I don't, I, I don't know if people get that. I don't, that wasn't you making a point. That's just you where you are. You know, you, you just, that's just where you are. And you just reflecting. You know, yeah. you know your conviction. Absolutely. Um, and praise God for that. Yeah. Um, just a couple of closing questions. You are there any? Uh, are there any? 
great white whales out of that. You've preached a lot of, of, the, of the scriptures. You've preached through a lot of it. Is there a section you say, boy, I haven't, met, I haven't spent much time there, but uh, if, I, if I could, if I had to take on something, is, is there any area like that? In the scriptures left? You've spent most of your time in the New Testament? Testament. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you're right. You're right. Uh, you know what? I, I, I was saying to myself, I personally, just for my own personal, I, I would like to spend some time with the prophets. Hmm. I'd like to, I'd really like to do some Old Testament studies. Mm -hmm. Um and, um, you know, just for my own personal use and growth. Um, I, I think that's what I'd like to do. That's great. Yeah. That's great. I, um, I think for me now, I was, I, I was asked this question, didn't have a good answer to it last week. But I've spent a lot of time in the epistles mm -hmm. and in some narrative Old Testament and mm -hmm. Psalms. I haven't, I would like to one day preach through a, a gospel. Yeah. Um, which is not something yeah. I've done. But you're going to be there a minute. Yeah. <laughs> if you're you will. Uh, yeah. Um, you've written a couple of books. Mm -hmm. um, Heart of a Champion, is it one of them? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm being a champion. Yeah. And the other is. Um, God Grits and More. God Grits and More. Uh, those books, you can find them on Amazon.com? Yeah. Those books by Dr. Ari Williams, you can find on Amazon. Do you have any more book ideas? You want to write some more? You know what? Did you enjoy <laughs> writing? Did that process? Did you enjoy it? You know what? I, I did. Uh, I, I really, it was almost, the first one was almost cathartic for me and getting some things out that had been kind of bottled in, mm -hmm. you know, life stories and what have you, things mm -hmm. like that, that really, I, it was, I needed that. Sure. Um, now there's some things I want to do now. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now that that's out of the way. Yeah, right? that's out of the way. I uh -huh. want some things I want to do. Yeah, that's cool. Talk about. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Well, one more question. Mm -hmm. You've been generous with the time. You, um, if you can get in a time machine, I like to ask this question. If you can get in a time machine, go back 35 years, and this R.A. Williams has an opportunity to talk to that R.A. Williams, that young R.A. Williams, 35 years ago, just getting to town. Uh, you're gonna be a stretch of your ministry here. What do you know now that you would tell that young, younger R.A. Williams? Trust God. Mm -hmm. I would say trust God. Trust what God is doing in your life. Mm. He's not making a mistake. Uh, he loves you. Uh, he's got a plan for you. Uh, don't believe the lie of the devil. Don't don't ever entertain it. That God doesn't care. That he doesn't love you. That he's not with you. Hmm. I think and those are the things at first I struggled with. I struggled with that idea that if you do right, you <laughs> No. Yeah. You know, you live godly, you'll suffer persecution. Yeah. And so, you you you've got to come to the point that that's part of it. Mm -hmm. That's part of the package. It's mm -hmm. not something unusual. It's not, as Peter said, don't think it's strange. Right. It's not strange. It's it's part of the package. It's the goes with it. Mm -hmm. And I think that was one of the things I really really struggled with that I think if I had known better I mean I, I, I would have slept a little bit easier I would have uh, 
going on about my business a little bit better. I would have mm. had a better attitude. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Trust God. Wow, that's great. Joy Anything else come are. to mind that you would say to that younger? Yeah, learn your lessons well. Learn your lessons, learn well. Your lessons well. Wherever mm -hmm. God has you, I mean, you're in school. He's taking you mm. through it. He's uh, training, educating, uh, firming your character. He's doing a whole. He's doing a whole lot. He's just, as I look back, man, I see so much that he was trying to help me with, and I was fighting all the way. Mm. I mean, you know, I'm just saying I've. I've always, you know, you, you, you grow up with a certain mentality and, <laughs> you know, you got to be good. If you be good, Lord bless you. Well, you know, you got to come to conclusions. Some, you got to suffer sometimes, too. Sure. Sure. And, I think, and in fact, that God is sovereign. Yeah. And it means this is his business. That's what you got to come to grips with. Yes. I mean, if I had to, I really struggled with that mm -hmm. in my younger ministry. I could not for the life of me understand why. Yeah. But, I mean, I know now. Yeah. And so... That's why I, I, I do my best to tell people now who are struggling with that, it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Believe me, it's, it's okay. Mm -hmm. You're not forgotten. Yeah. In fact, this is a sign that you're under construction. Yeah. And once you know that, you, you, you're okay. The, uh, you know, while we're, while pe we're playing around with the, you know, that, that at the end, Job got doubled and all of that. We like to play around with yeah. the, the, you know, neatly wrap up the end of the story. One thing we don't tell people is he still never got his questions answered, you know. You know, he never got his questions answered. No. I mean, basically, no. God told him, I'm God and you're not. Yeah. That's pretty much the answer. <laughs> Whatever you're asking, I'm God and you're not. And, and he's yeah. like, you know, okay. <laughs> um, and, and, and that's kind of how life, yeah. the life of Faith works. Absolutely. Yeah. You have a, I, I know I keep saying this is the last question, but <laughs> from your years of commitment to expository preaching, your leadership of a national conference on preaching, and you, you're well-traveled and an itinerant preaching, from, your, from all of the encounters, what you see at, on your perch, is you, what is encouraging to you about what you're seeing in preaching right now? Younger preachers, um, what, what's troubling you as from what you're seeing and observing you know, in preaching right now? Oftentimes, honestly, I think what troubles me is a whole lot of application that's not based on solid interpretation. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the application is good. It's, it's, it will sometimes make sense to people. It's, but it's, yeah. it's not based on text. It's not, it's faulty. There could be heresy in application too. That's what I'm saying and I, I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. You hear that, and you hear people responding to that. That troubles me. Mm -hmm. That troubles me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else that you see? Oh, I, I think guys' emphasis. Is it, you know, the emphasis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think the emphasis is wrong. Yeah. You, know, well, you can get a financial breakthrough out of every text. Huh? <laughs> this is wrong. Yeah, sure. It's wrong. It's, yeah. <laughs> so like and, it's, and it's foolishness. Yeah, it's wrong. You and I think the uh, troubling thing about it is we, people are looking for hope. 
-hmm. And when you offer out in the name of God and by manipulating scripture, that which places people's hope in something that God has not promised, it's, it's just, a, it's, it's damnable. Yeah. It is. That hurts. Yes, I mean, sir. that's why when I see that, I just. And what you, uh, what you have been saying throughout this time together is important for preachers and for Christians. We, we, we don't have a robust theology of suffering in the midst of that. You gotta, <laughs> you know, suffering's like not in fine print. It's part of the, <laughs> it's like real, it's like yeah. really in there a lot. Yeah, it is. Don't, you, don't be surprised when this happens. It's like, means yeah. you shouldn't be, I'm not sure all the Greek words there, but yeah. I'm sure it means you shouldn't be surprised <laughs> when, you, when you suffer. You're absolutely right. And if, if everything right. is an unbroken chain of health, wealth, and success, people will not know to learn to trust God. Yeah. And, and their whole worldview and view of God just gets thrown out of whack yeah. when that stuff doesn't pan out. Yeah. Anything encouraging that you're seeing from your vantage point? Well, Do yeah. you think expository preaching is on the rise? Well, you know what? I think it's here to stay. Oh, hey, man. <laughs> uh -huh. I think God's going to always save himself a remnant of yeah. some people who do it right, and he's going to raise them up. And I think, I think uh, uh, you know, it, it hurts sometimes to see you know what's going on in the name? Of, it really hurts. I'm gonna say that before again. It really hurts. And younger guys are swayed by, as Doc Pat would say, the cash commodities, the clothes, <laughs> and the cottage in the country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. That's what I. I really. I hate that. Sure. If. If uh, I hate that, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. well, Dr. Williams, it's good to have you in town, and I'm greatly appreciative of you taking this time. Man, it's it's good being here. I almost feel like Jed Clampett when I look at this place. We, <laughs> we doggy. <laughs> and let me just personally thank you for the blessing you've been to me and my ministry over the years, the example and the kindness you've been, and it's a uh, joy to have had this opportunity to share your story you. thank you and uh stay on the course got to do that yes sir thank you thank you for watching